Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Gemstones and illustrious jewels transcended their roles as mere symbols of monarchical power, prestige, and authority. Beyond their allure, these treasures played critical roles in building and reinforcing alliances, resolving financial obligations, and, in times of dire need, aiding in escapes. The security of these regal adornments was a critical concern, especially amidst the chaos of warfare. In this video, I'll look a few interesting tales from history of how royal jewels were hidden to prevent them from being stolen. Before we begin, please support my channel by clicking the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you. George VI initiated a secretive operation, instructing for the jewels to be concealed within the castle's premises, a fact that remained so well concealed that the Queen Elizabeth II only became aware of it during the filming of a BBC documentary in 2018. This clandestine effort to safeguard the jewels from the Nazis was unveiled through a series of letters from an ex-royal librarian showcased in a BBC documentary. These letters describe the ingenious method of hiding the gems inside a Bath Oliver biscuit tin before burying them in Windsor Castle's grounds. To ensure the operation remained undetected, especially from German aircraft, the excavation sites were camouflaged with tarpaulins at night. Subsequently, grass was allowed to grow back over these spots near one of the castle's secure entrances to further obscure their location. Ultimately, the crown jewels were secured within two specially constructed chambers, each fortified with steel doors and accessible only via a trapdoor. Royal expert Alistair Bruce unearthed this remarkable narrative and discussed it with the Queen for an upcoming broadcast centered around the coronation. He explained that they had to cover the freshly dug, stark white chalk with tarpaulins to prevent the German Luftwaffe from spotting any unusual activity during their nocturnal flights. The daring plan was detailed in letters from Sir Owen Morshid, the Royal Librarian, to Queen Mary, George VI's mother. In these correspondences, he detailed the careful removal of the most valuable gems from the Imperial State Crown, which is traditionally worn during the state opening of Parliament, so they could be securely stored separately in times of crisis. Sir Owen also meticulously extracted the Black Prince's ruby and St. Edward's sapphire from their settings to place them inside the biscuit tin. Mr. Bruce noted the Queen's complete unawareness of this episode, stating, It was quite peculiar, yet delightful, to share this with her. Speculations regarding the whereabouts of the crown jewels during World War II have been wide-ranging, suggesting various hiding places from a vault in Canada, a prison in Devon, to even a Welsh cave. Let us now move back a few decades when the Russian nobility faced their own desperate situation under the shadow of revolution. The 1917 revolution had Russian nobles freaking out over their riches. They were stashing gold and diamonds left and right to keep them from the Bolsheviks, hoping to smuggle jewels out of the country when they got the chance. Starting with the big shots, even the family of Nicholas II, who had abdicated and was under house arrest, tried to save their priceless jewels. Alexandra Feodorovna and her daughters sneakily sewed diamonds, emeralds, and rubies into their corsets and skirt seams. They were so sneaky about it that no one caught on until the royal family was executed. But some of the Romanovs had better luck hiding their treasures, managing to get a significant chunk out of Russia. Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, spouse of Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich of Russia and uncle to Nicholas II, displayed remarkable resourcefulness during the turmoil of the 1917 revolution, being among the few from the Tsarist family to flee abroad while salvaging a portion of her jewelry collection. Following the February Revolution, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, accompanied by her children after the passing of her husband in 1909, sought refuge in Kislovodsk. Entrusting the diplomat Albert Stopford with the task she directed him to locate her jewels concealed behind a clandestine door and wrapped in newspaper. In the autumn of 1917, leveraging his diplomatic privileges, 
Stopford journeyed to London bearing 244 jewelry items within his Gladstone bag. Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna was particularly clever, breaking down her tiara to hide the pieces in an inkwell after dumping out the ink and covering them with melted wax. Then she just topped it off with more ink, screwed the lid back on and left it on her desk. The soldiers searching her room didn't suspect a thing. We hid other jewels in homemade paperweights and empty cocoa tins, dipped them in wax with a wick to make them look like big church candles. We'd light them in front of icons to throw servants off the scent, Maria Pavlovna said. She mentioned other sneaky ways her relatives used, like her mother-in-law sewing a sort of jacket to wear under her dress, hiding most of the stones in it. Diadems that couldn't be flattened got sewn into her hat linings. In 1920, Maria Pavlovna set sail from Novorossiysk on an Italian ship bound for Venice, with plans to settle down in France. Unfortunately, she passed away shortly afterwards, and her jewelry collection was inherited by her children. In an effort to improve their financial situation, her descendants sold many items from her collection. Notably, Queen Mary bought the damaged Vladimir Tiara and had it restored by Gerard, the royal jeweler. The rich folks back then were really into tricking the revolutionary soldiers to keep their valuables safe. They came up with all kinds of clever hiding spots, like carving out spaces in women's heels or men's boots to stash gold coins and jewels. Another popular hideout was soap. They'd slice a bar in half, scoop out a big hole in each piece to stuff with rings, earrings, and stones, then stick the pieces back together. They'd smooth over the seam and run it underwater so you couldn't see the cut, making it impossible for even the most suspicious revolutionary to notice. The most fascinating discovery, however, wouldn't come to light for another 90 years. In November 1918, Maria Pavlovna, with the help of her confident professor Richard Bergholtz, managed to safely transfer a portion of her jewelry collection to the Swedish embassy in Petrograd, present-day St. Petersburg, through the assistance of a trusted British diplomat who transported it from Kislovodsk. Unfortunately, the Grand Duchess died without revealing the whereabouts of this hidden treasure to her family. It wasn't until 2009 that two pillowcases filled with around 60 pieces of jewelry, including Fabergé cigarette cases, gold cufflinks with precious stones, and other valuables, were discovered in the archives of the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. An equally fascinating story unfolded in its time in France. The doomed Queen of France, in a desperate bid to safeguard her treasures, clandestinely transported her jewels from the palace in a wooden chest, with some remaining elusive for centuries. In March 1791, as King Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, and their children plotted their escape from France, the Queen meticulously wrapped her assortment of diamonds, rubies, and pearls in cotton within the confines of the Tuileries Palace. Madame Campan, Marie Antoinette's lady-in-waiting, chronicled the Queen's meticulous efforts. Subsequently, the jewels were dispatched to Brussels, a territory governed by the Queen's sister, Archduchess Marie Christine, and home to Count Mercy Argento. Count Mercy Argento, a former Austrian ambassador to Paris, held the Queen's trust and received the precious cargo, forwarding it to Vienna for safekeeping under the Austrian Emperor, Marie Antoinette's nephew. Mercy Argenteau, a steadfast ally of the royal family, preserved the chest untouched and unopened, harboring hopes of one day returning it to the young French Queen. However, on 16 October 1793, Marie Antoinette met her tragic end at the guillotine, leaving behind the jewels in the care of her family. For the ensuing two centuries, these precious heirlooms remained hidden from public view until their eventual auction by Christie's. And here's a history of the Scottish crown jewels. The Scottish regalia, known as the Honours of Scotland, comprises a crown refurbished by James V in 1540, a scepter bestowed upon James IV in 1494, and the sword of state, gifted to James IV in 1507. These artifacts were first utilized together during the coronation ceremonies of Scottish monarchs commencing in 1543. 
However, amid the turbulence of the English Civil War, following the execution of Charles I by Oliver Cromwell, the Scottish crown jewels were clandestinely concealed to shield them from potential destruction by Cromwell. Following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the subsequent union of Scotland with England in 1707, these invaluable treasures were safeguarded in storage within Edinburgh Castle. Gradually fading from memory, they were believed lost until 1818. It was during this time that Sir Walter Scott, the esteemed novelist and fervent Scott, led an expedition through the castle's storerooms in pursuit of the long-lost jewels. After an extensive search, Scott stumbled upon a securely locked oak chest. Hidden beneath layers of linen lay the Scottish crown jewels, precisely where they had been placed in 1707. Since their rediscovery, these revered artifacts have been proudly exhibited at Edinburgh Castle, allowing all to marvel at their splendor. That's it from me. Hope you learned something new. Let me know which story blew you away the most and which treasure hiding method caught you off guard the most. Thank you for watching this video. Share your impressions in the comments and support my channel by subscribing and liking. Thank you.